I just see Alan. And what is happening, everyone? Welcome on in to the Check Your Brain podcast. It is hosted by me, Tony Mazur. That is my podcast logo. If you're watching on YouTube or Rumble, uh, please subscribe to my Rumble because God only knows how long my YouTube's going to stick around at this rate. Uh, and also, if you're listening on the free podcast platforms, you heard a little Rick Monroe and the Hitmen that to open today's podcast. I'm doing this all in post. Uh, but uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. And those are my guests this week. But before I get to them, if you want more content from me, go to patreon.com slash Tony Mazer, $3, $5, $10 a month. You get extra content for early access to guests and what have you. I'll do Q and A's and everything like that. So again, three, five, $10 a month for the check your brain podcast on my Patreon. And my name is Tony Mazer, but if you don't want to pay me any money, at least pay a couple of bucks for God's sake to go check out this new album by my guests. Well, actually guess it's the Hitmen with Rick Monroe. It's Rick Monroe and the Hitmen. They have a new album coming out this week. As I post this, it is uh, coming up here. It's six guns soul by Rick Monroe and the Hitmen. So go to Amazon and uh, go stream it. Uh, I, I, I don't know what the streaming numbers are. It's something like for every 10,000 streams, you get half a penny. I don't know what it is, but buy the actual album if you can, if you enjoy their music. And I'm looking forward to seeing them coming up soon. But Rick, you've been on the podcast before. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, well, thanks for having us, man. And Good who do we have here in the studio? Well, we have Alan right here, Alan Beeler, bass player. We have Jason Bowl, the drummer. And then you have Bobby Perkins, the guitar player, the hitman. I'm Rick Monroe and it's the hitman. Excellent. And uh, it's it's good to have you guys and uh, got the new album. Um, you know, I I talked to you, Rick, about a, a year and a half ago, and I think you guys were still you were cutting some tracks and you're trying out some different music. You're going out on tour. And so what finally got to the point where you're like, hey, instead of putting out singles, put out, putting out EPs, it's like, hey, we have enough material for a full album. When did that come about? Well, the whole plan was to always put out a full album at the end of the cycle. So everything was like, keep putting out singles. You know, we were trying to do about every six to eight weeks. And then we were looking at the end of that, obviously, then to, to do it. We actually have a lot more material that's still in the can for other stuff. And we're going back in to record more. So we're always going to be way ahead of ourselves on material. But it just kind of came to the point where, like, okay, I think we've got the right, you know, combination of, um, of songs put together for this specific album. In the days of Spotify and the streaming, it's got to be interesting to put an album out because we remember back in the days of you put an album out and, you know, some tracks may be better than others, whatever, but, and then you have your lead tracks and the, the whole science behind putting out an album. And how is that? I, I Obviously it's changed since then. And a lot of, well, a lot of bands, a lot of singers will just put out single, 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 single. And you guys are still going the old fashioned route of, Hey, we're just good. We're going to put out an LP here. Yeah. Well, I mean, we started like again with the single thing, but then what was like when we went in to actually create the thing? There's like, tell them about like the timing. Oh uh, well, let's see. I mean, it, it uh, probably took us like three months to get through all the all the recording and stuff. And uh, I think we had like fourteen or fifteen songs just together then. Yeah. At that point, trying to get it on. But the uh, same like, but figuring out the album is you actually have to figure out the time frame too, because you only have like what twenty two minutes per side. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. So it's like, so you get 22 minutes per side. So you also have to figure out what songs you want to put on it. And there's another thing like the um, actual grooves, you know, the more active a song is, you want to have that towards the front of the album and the mellower stuff at the back because the shorter grooves are harder to handle the, the pressure, like all that. We didn't know any of that. And um, that's why bands did all these like weird um, extra tracks because they had like a minute and a half left. So, I mean, now next time we do a record, um, which we will, we'll be adding some weird crap at the end just because if we have the time. Cause, but it was kind of cool that we actually were like, like, you should have seen Alan and I, we'd been in um, Texas and we went by the manufacturer. They showed us how it was made and they explained to us the time thing. And so we had to sit there and figure out, you know, the timing of all the songs. And it was funny, us all like going, and we're all doing it on text. The other du dudes were at home and we're all saying, well, how about this? How about this? And then coming up with the actual running order. So long gone, long gone are the days of Stranglehold by Ted Nugent. It's like, oh, it's about an eight and a half minute song. It's like, oh, we should probably get this crack in about three and a half, four minutes, right? Yeah, unless you just want to have one song on the side of a record, which that'd be nice too. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> be well, in a Gata De Vita by the Hitmen. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're just, that's another thing. We're just going to be like, here's our four album, two song record. I think that's why that one guest's live solo album was only like yeah. three songs. Yeah. <laughs> or like the Allman Brothers. <laughs> it's like, well, 
we have a it's a double album you know <laughs> yeah one song um so but it, the cool thing hey man nothing is really cool about this is so when we had the opportunity to, to get them made you can make them like just plain black vinyl and that's a certain price but the guy's like look we have all this leftover vinyl um pieces that, that uh if you want to do a randomized one it's the same as the black one but you have no idea which one you're going to get so we have every single one of our albums are completely different colors like this Ooh, one okay like this one like this is really cool too this is like some kind of a like i don't know Red reddish maroon, maroon burgundy ish thing Cran yeah, cranberry, cranberry it's like yeah. cranberry and some of them are like you'll see pictures of them and they're they're green or orange and you know it's funny because billy eilish just started complaining about people doing multiple versions of uh vinyl but we're actually repurposing old vinyl to do this so it's pretty cool yeah, because that's the one thing that uh, I believe Neil Young was talking about uh, what has happened when it comes to vinyl and that in some ways that they're manipulating some vinyl that it's the digital copy that they're putting on vinyl, but you, but the audience doesn't know that. So when they put the needle on, they drop it down, they think, oh, we're getting that, that crisp sound. And in reality, you're just getting the same MP3 version you're going to get on Spotify. Now, is, is that what different from what you guys are doing? Well, no, we, we had it mastered for vinyl. I mean, okay, was, good. Uh, yes. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. You're still recording digital at, at this time. So, I mean, maybe in that sense, he's saying that, but you know, a Southern man don't need him around anyways. Who's this new young guy? Thank you very much. Um, so um, anyways, but didn't, didn't Neil leave Spotify for like a week until they needed money again? I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. He, he, he left a little bit and then he decided yeah. to, yeah. Yeah, yeah so right. and and good for Spotify. They're like, let's see, should we get a guy who hasn't put out anything anybody's gave a shit about in forty five years, or the biggest podcast on the planet? Hmm, I don't know. Well, who knows? But <laughs> uh, by by the way, when it comes to recording, because I'm uh, way be beyond novice, I don't know how that goes into. I know podcast and radio recording, but uh, it, it do uh, in a recording studio do do they still partake in the loudness war? In the loudness war? Yeah, do, do you know what that is? Where that there was like this whole, like, for example, Alice in Chains had the, uh, where I kind of got my the name of my podcast, but there there was uh, Check My Brain, which was their, right. uh, one of their songs. And it was, when you look at the levels and it's just maxed out, like full on. And there was a whole loudness war that was going on in the early digital age. I don't know if that was still going on as far as pressing copies. I mean, I think that, I mean, well, yeah. But, but. I was just going to say, I think a lot of people still like, you know, all the sound waves are basically giant fat caterpillars, but then you don't really have a lot of dynamics. And I think, you know, you want to try to, you want to try to find a happy medium to what's going to be comparable to what's out there, but you also want to create stuff that has a dynamic. Yeah. Cause then who else did that? Uh, Black Crows, right? Wasn't that one of the bands somebody was talking about? We I overheard that when they were recording, they just were blaring. Blaring. Yeah, a lot of, and, but some you of it, amps, you get well, like, well, like you, well, yeah, when it comes to amps, well, that's yeah, the other thing too, is like, yeah. well, when you come to an amp, a tube amp, you want the tube amp cranked as loud as it can be, so the breakup is is, is the best. I mean, there's, you know what, it all comes down to your own personal preference, and right. at the end of the day, it comes down to really good songs. So if you put really good songs and, and good players together, you're going to find the sounds that are going to fit, but it's all your personal preference, you know, and it, it comes down, we were just talking about different parts, and Bobby's like, I didn't like this part. I don't, you know, so it's like a cool, then let's find a part you like because nobody, you know, Alan said it best. He's like, well, I don't have to play it every night. You do. So, <laughs> so let's find something you're going to be happy with. So, I mean, you, you got to always come to those kind of compromises and, and that kind of a thing as well. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Queens of the Stone Age. And for a while, Josh Homme, the lead singer, was doing the Steely Dan thing where it's, it's him and then a collection, a rotation of bass guitars then the next track is another bass guitars I, I watched a whole documentary on peg by steely dan and they auditioned how many people on bass how many people on drums how many on the lead guitar and so instead of, it was like musical uh, it really was musical chairs as far as who's going to audition for that part and eventually i think they settled on a band so for you going that route of finding the hitmen, finding a, a group of guys that not only are you going to go out on tour and play these songs with, but we're also going to go in the studio. How did the hitmen all come together? Were you guys just all playing in different honky tonks in Nashville? And you're like, hey, this guy's pretty good. You want to join my band? Because I know, you, Rick, you were solo for a long time. Yeah, no, it, it actually started when we um we went to, uh, we did a West Coast tour 
and we're just doing it as a Rick Monroe thing. And that was, that was actually Alan and Bobby were in the band at the time. And uh, of course COVID hit. So we came back and it was kind of, we'd been there, you know, when, cause everybody at the beginning of COVID thought, well, you know, you can't hang out with other people. You got to stick to your little group. You know, you can't go places, you know, no one knew. So we were like, well, we just kept hanging out together. We started streaming live, which we really got a killer streaming sound going. And that was kind of a thing. And that was what started it because Alan, we had nothing to do. And I was like, hey, every Tuesday, let's start writing songs. And so we started doing that. And those songs started to grow. And that's basically where Six Gun Soul album came from. And then once we got into the studio, start cutting some of this, it was like, well, this is more of a band. And then we had Jason come in and started cutting a couple of the tracks. And it was like, yeah, this is this is the band. This is how it should sound. And so it was like, because there's a sound I've always been looking for that's kind of the the, the perfect hybrid of country and rock. And this band it, with these members are definitely like what makes that happen. So that was kind of, it was born out of, you know, COVID yeah, basically. The current group of that, yeah, predating yeah. that. So you have kind of grabbed other people from the other circumstances. Me, it was like you'd said, it was playing in a honky tonk and the bass player that was his bass player at the time, I was playing with and he grabbed me a lot. Yeah, we need a guitar player. He's like, oh, check this guy out. <laughs> Showing off a little while playing, you know, it's the older catalog and whatnot, smooth covers. And then and he had to jump ship and we didn't really have a steady drummer at the time because a lot of those guys... Uh, like a lot of the Broadway cats are always floating in Broadway and, you know, Broadway, the downtown strip there. They're floating in between that and the road. You know, they don't want to commit and whatnot. Um, so I was like, okay, I need a bass player and a drummer. I knew a drummer at the time, and he's like, I knew a bass player from Kentucky. That's what we called Alan. And, oh, yeah. uh, Alan, Alan made it. Alan made it. He's still Alan, here. Alan's a great story. <laughs> that, was Alan, not, that was not this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, <laughs> t- tell him what, what you were doing when we found you. I weighed about 250 pounds, and I was working at a factory. <laughs> and and wow. it did. It was, it was pretty miserable. <laughs> he was drinking himself to death. My, my, my buddy <laughs> called me and was like, hey, I have, some, I have a couple of sub gigs on bass uh, if you want to do them. So I went out and rented a bass amp and a, ba- and a bass. <laughs> He's actually a guitar player. Wait, you didn't, you didn't think it was like a submarine? A sub gig? Sorry. <laughs> that would have been, that been <laughs> sweet. <laughs> no, but I rented a bass amp and a bass and came out and did the sub gigs. and uh. Yeah, and he's been here ever since. Yeah. I mean, like I said, Jason came into the studio to kind of like, you know, help us knock out a couple tracks to the producer, you know, Malcolm, who was producing the record, like wanted him to do the stuff. And so uh, we we had a drummer at the time, but it didn't work out. And so when, when that guy finally kind of cleared out, Jason was available and that. So that's been pretty much for the last couple of years, that's been the hitman. And so that's what we're putting this record out under. And so... That's, well, that's great that. that like you you weren't you went the opposite of an egotistical lead singer and lead instead of just going like no this is my band and we're all gonna be under the Rick Monroe name it's like no no we're a cohesive unit and you guys all kept together so that sounds sounds really cool and uh, that is interesting you, uh, what do you mention about being uh, in one of those bands up and down Nashville so you get guys play at uh, Tootsie's and Roberts and everything and they just seem to just hang out there. That it does. Do they want to go out on tour? Like, do they want to be a band, or they're just like, yeah, I live in Nashville, just play, and then I can go home that night? Or are they really, comfortable really, with that lifestyle? Really okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. It really depends. Everybody's different, you know. Some people want to do a little blend of both. Some people uh, just get started down there and they want to get on the road, be road full time. Some people uh, supplement downtown a little bit while on the road, and then they just get off the road because they're sick of it. You know, they want to be home in their own beds. And, and you know, um, you, know you, make, you can make a lot of money downtown if you have the right gigs, the right shifts, the right days, you know. What's the best venue in Nashville? What's the worst? Best venue in Nashville. Like acoustics, crowd, uh, whatever. I would say the best acoustics would probably be the Ryman, like as far as just a straight up to play it. Like Ryman, not not what we heard when we were well, I was going to say acoustics because <laughs> I heard acoustics uh, they're hard to battle but it seems pretty cool no he's talking about like the Brub Bar yeah, the Broadway. Yeah. but I'm saying for uh, me though the, what I heard one of oh the yeah is that. yeah the, I would yeah. out of the state the main uh, uh, floor on stage is really cool yeah. that's a cool vibe it's a, got a good sound and I played up there and it sounds really good there that's um, your main in Nashville is at the stage the stage is very good yeah believe it or not Tin Roof Main is very good I've had some of my best times there um for that's for all the big, you know, the amps and stage, the acoustic drums. A lot of these clubs now with all the uh, star bar names on them are all going digital, even digital drums. So you got to wear the in-ear <laughs> monitors and have it all in there. It can be a little strange. Uh, Jason Aldean's rooftop's been one of my favorites as far as that one is concerned. Oh, well, they all have their pros and cons. Actually, even Old Red's pretty good. Old Red's pretty good. Old Red is a nice room. It's a yeah. nice setup. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So as far as the worst. 
Not, probably I would say almost, I've had some good sounds with my amp the way it's set up at Tootsie's Main, but you can't move there. It's the <laughs> no, base. yeah, absolutely. It's tiny, really yeah. tiny. That's funny. The, the, uh, my main complaint at Tootsie's is that the bands are too close together and you can hear both of them at the same, yeah. at the but, same time. But the back, the back room, <laughs> you know, a lot of people probably like the back room they don't like. I really like the back room and the top stage has been real, a really, really good one too. I would almost yeah, have... you're, you're right on top of it. I, I've been to Tootsie's a couple of times and the uh i think my biggest complaint as an audience member is uh why is the paps blue ribbon nine dollars there but if i go to roberts and get the same friggin beer it's two dollars <laughs> <laughs> welcome to nashville yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they they're not betting on the uh the, the regulars and people that frequent there a lot to figure that out they're wanting the ones that come in and like tootsies i'll take a pbr ten dollars you got it. <laughs> That's like 40 year old virgin, but actually in real life. Oh, nine dollar beer night. Yeah. Um yeah. I, I I took my wife because she's uh my, my wife likes a lot of the bro country and uh I'm which sorry. which is go gonna lead me to a segue here. But we went over to the Florida Georgia line place and she likes the Florida Georgia line. So we walk in and downstairs was Taylor Swift music was played, and upstairs was uh Lil John and Yin Yang twins. And she's like, This isn't country. And I said, Neither is what you listen to. Man, <laughs> <we've heard." laughs> Good man. And now were you were you ordered to sleep on the couch? Yeah. After that? <laughs> so the reason the reason I came about and, and I started being okay. a fan of you guys, uh, of listening to Rick first and listening to what you guys have put out is I like the, the classic rock sound, the old school, the outlaw country, but country, of course, as you know, we've talked about, it, it's been in the, the news recently, is it's popifying way more. We've seen this in the last decade with the aforementioned George, Florida Georgia line. You've got the the Sam Hunts, the Kane Browns, and really no offense, they, I mean, they're popular, they're, they're good at what they do, but that, what is that, the click track or something where it's, a, again, an electric drums? Snaps and, and class. Just, just not country to me, just in my opinion, in different strokes, but uh, it's just country has a, a specific genre. And when I'm hearing what is like a pop hip hop type of song, but you put a little twang, you're like, eh, I don't know. I don't know. I can't, I can't get with this. Yeah. And um, I would almost even say that I feel in my personal opinion, as I see it through my lens is that country has kind of always been evolving and changing. Cause like you look at the, 90s country all the old cats of the 60s and 70s would be look at 90s country as not what they consider country either they would say change into something that they don't agree with and then maybe 90s change even like early 2000s once al dean came in and heavier sounding guitar amps are getting put on it even garth brooks before that um so i think it was always changing so maybe you label it americana to encompass everything what does country mean at the time i guess so it's always allowed it's it's never allowed it I feel like country has just kind of always been like, we'll let you change us at the, you know, if it was a person, we'll let you change us into whatever the hell you guys want at this point in time where a lot of forms of music, you know, people or musical stay as it's supposed to be and not allow itself to be changed. If that makes any sense. Well, the weird thing is when I first, when I first came to Nashville, Nashville was very much about that's not how we do it. And they, they, they had kind of a, 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 a wall against a lot of stuff and they were very adamant about keeping things traditional in, in a way, because I'd be like, hey, I want to do this and this and this. Like, well, we don't do that here. But the money starts to become so good when you start realizing that Florida Georgia Line can bring in a 15, 16-year-old girl to a country concert, and you just start seeing those dollar signs. Everybody was like, well, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, granted, it doesn't sound. And, and now it's because it's completely because of that. And it's understandable because, I mean, money, you know, pays your mortgage, so you can't blame people. And and it's become a catch-all. Like rock and roll used to be ABBA to ZZ Top, right? That would like you go into a, a music store and it was like this huge thing. Country is now that. I remember I remember going into record stores and country was about this big of a section. You know, it was like small and it was all rock. Now country would be and most time you rock. Know. But back then, even when you said, uh, I remember when I was a kid in the bus, and anytime you said, I like country, it's like, oh, wow, you're, you're, you're lame. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and there's, or something, you know. Uh, so, I don't know, I mean, little, country's a... Hearing. Now, nowadays, it's like, uh, well, what do you like? I like country. Hey, everybody likes country. Yeah. Shit, half the uh, rock and rollers out there that are like, oh, badass, I'm going country now. 
Yeah, everybody's gone country. Like, but... like I'll never forget, like when Kid Rock went country. I'm like, wait, the bar with the bar guy went country, you know? <laughs> you know, you know, and that's uh, you know, uh, mud shovel, mud shovel, to, you know. I'm a country boy. You know? I want to hear a country version of Mud Shovel. I, I want him to go up on stage and have that with like a like a like a pick slide or something and start playing Mud Shovel when I hear that bass start up. I mean, he lives the life. He lives the life. He is. He's he legitimate. Life, yeah. So I get that. But like even like when uh, Stephen Tyler, I'm not really trying to bash these guys. But like when he was gonna, I'm gonna go country, right? Yeah. And he, I remember and he that. Said, yeah. And I was like, yeah. and at the time he had like the little like the little Renaissance stash or whatever oh, yeah. going on. I was yeah. like. Give it a try. Give yeah. it your best yeah. shot. I, I just, I think, yeah. I kind of think that a lot of people. Everybody's here, okay with it now. Is what I'm getting here's at. the deal: is country. country fans, like like people that become fans, it's a it's a full blown lifestyle. A country isn't just like I like a little bit of music. It's a lot of people that actually you know go out to the river, you know, have a boat on the lake, and go out fishing, go out hunting. All the things that are part of that lifestyle, that all is encompassed in that. So there's a lot more of these fans tend to be way more um, like they're, dedicated. They're, they're way dedicated. That's why like NASCAR fans, all these people that were like so into like you like to drive her, whatever that driver's brand was, you love them. When Junior was driving for, for Budweiser, it was Budweiser only. No one cared. That's what Junior drove. And that fan base is is just is rabid when it comes to that. And I think people could see dollar signs. And so when they can when they can kind of like suck in more and more people into that. And kind of create you know, the thing of the hip hop and this and that and mix it. They're just going to keep you know trying to generate more and more income, and it works. And a lot of the country bars that we used to play in between our sets that always play hip hop. So there was going to be a natural progression where I think hip hop yeah. is going to find its way into country anyways. Yeah, really yeah, and, and Jelly Jelly Roll is like the biggest act that's out right now, and he was a hip hop guy for a long time. So. Um, it, it it is an easier transition, I guess, um, especially you know in lower income areas. But I, the one I think of when I is a guy who's worked in radio. You talk about with the P one audience, and that's why. And this is where I get into talk about Beyonce, is that the P one audience for folks who don't know in radio, those are your dedicated. That's the person. Your country station is right up there. Uh, that it's the first thing on your presets. And when you turn your car off and you turn it on, your country station's there. And not only that, like you said, that dedication that they're going to the concerts, they're calling in and winning tickets. Uh, and the biggest one is the sponsors, that your sponsors on that country station are tailored to your audience. So you're like, okay, well, what are they like? Bush Light, Bass Pro Shop, all that kind of stuff. Your P1 audience. The thing is with Beyonce, Beyonce's audience is not a country station's P1. And if I were a radio program director, which I was until two years ago, thanks, Gino. Anyways. Um, <laughs> Gino. Yeah, Gino. He, he got to meet Gino this uh, last week. Or I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> now, Gino's good. We, we did a gig together about a month ago. It was, it was a good time. Uh, well, Gino dude. couldn't keep his head up after all the whiskey. He can't hang anymore. We had a <laughs> but, drink tequila, so. Oh, yeah. Oof. Yeah, he, it, but, but uh, I, when working in the, in radio and working in rock, you would see these different acts. Like, for example, I worked in an alternative station and there was a new Foo Fighters song that came out. And if you go to a Foo Fighters concert today, you don't really care that much about the news song. Like if Dave Grohl, who's your doppelganger, of course, uh, goes up on stage and goes like, we got a new song. You're like, okay, I can probably pee right now. You guys want a beer? I'm going to go get a beer. But you're not going to leave if they pl play Everlong or Monkey Wrench or My Hero or something like that. So are we really clamoring for new Weezer, new Foo Fighters, new whatever, but you're compelled to play it? The thing is a country station had to be compelled to play Beyonce, even if it's going to piss off their P1 audience. And it's kind of a catch-22. It's like damned if you do, damned if you don't. You, of course, you you want to put something that's very popular that you can attract, again, that 16-year-old girl who may not be in a country that she might keep the country station on, but then your hardcore bush light drinking, Bass Pro Shop shopping audience might go, yeah, I'm going to go check out the other station down the dial, or I've got Spotify. I've got this new Rick Monroe album. I'm going to go check that out instead. Yeah, well... I also have a belief that if like you had do have you got a big mixture now of pe people that like country that you key one audience some of them might more uh, gra gravitate towards like the Cody Johnson you know the actual country and then they might like the uh one the guy that just has the same old cookie cutter uh concept behind a song with the the you know the beat going behind it the dance the club beat which most country songs are in my opinion these days anyways 
Um, and uh, so, but you might have those those fans that are curtailed to on the you know the side is more of the you know uh, older country that they might not like it. I think those numbers you lose, you'll probably gain by the Beyonce followers, and then maybe add more. Maybe not. Maybe you know, it might be a watch. I think or... the problem with the Beyonce followers are they're Beyonce fans. So yeah, Beyonce had the had the top twenty six songs on iTunes country, not because of country fans, not because people think she's a country artist. Because Beyonce is a massive pop star. Yeah, exactly. So all of her fans are listening. So now she just knocked 26 country artists off the chart for the foreseeable future. And it's kind of like, is, does she really, is this something she really cares about? Or is it just another feather in her cap? I don't know. I mean, but whatever. I, you know, the, the, the cool thing about it is what we do, we don't really care about any of that stuff because we make music that we enjoy and we just put it out to our own audience. And we're so we're so genre fluent. We call ourselves polyjamorous because we, <laughs> we're like we really you can't really fit us into anything. Oh, there you go. There you go. Us doing a Beyonce thing, dude. Yeah. That, the best thing about that was, I said, "Hey, man, we should do this Beyonce song." And um, Alan's like, "No, nah, I don't. I don't know." And he's like, "I don't. I don't get it." Then when he like he he can't kind of started figuring out like the the riff. He's like, "Oh, this is pretty cool." And we call called Bobby I'm like hey we should do this Beyonce song and he's like uh I'm doing some stuff we played him like a little bit of it he's like I'm on my way I'm on my way over <laughs> he drove he over. me out of it, it was so, so he drove over pretty good. and he saw us we do our boots and shorts so we figured we would make it a boots and shorts thing and Bobby's just like whatever and it was cool because he's just like give me something to throw on I don't care let's just do this and we did and it was kind of in a, in a, in a thing to show that you know we turned her song into in a pretty traditional country vibe you know, anyways, and good music's music. I mean, I, I I could get really hung up on like what she's doing or not doing and her fans and why they're doing it and all that. But at the end of the day, it's kind of out of our 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 realm, sort of. Also, it's it might probably might just not be made for us. Yeah. You know, and we obviously all heard a bit of that her song or whatever. And I remember when it started out, the B I was like, okay, if I was clubbing, lyrics didn't come on yet. Yeah, I, I could feel it move me a little bit, and even when it started out, but then the repetitive woo 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 thing or whatever, I was just like, all right, I'm I'm done. It sounds like most other country stuff. I've what do you think anyways. about it? I haven't heard anything from you yet. I honestly haven't even listened to the song. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> but uh, you know, but I'm like, are all the songs like that? I don't know, but I haven't dove into it. It's probably not made for me anyways. And, yeah. You know, I'm whatever. I'm sure I've read a couple people giving her reviews, and maybe there's some stories that they can relate to. And if that does something for them, so be it. Oh, well, it's not for me. You know, I just, I just wish, maybe, but I wish people would just know. judge it basically on what it is, but there seems to be now a lot of sh social and cultural stuff like yeah, wrapped around it. Big time. Yeah, yeah. It's a partisan thing. Like yeah. if you don't like it, it's because of certain reasons or if you yeah. do like it. And honestly, man, nobody, I, I, nobody really cares about anything except for good songs. So if you put out good mm -hmm. songs that reach and touch people, that's all that matters. All the other stuff is peripheral noise. And, um, you know, and I, and that's one of the things I hate to see is a lot of these magazines and people are, are, are like pushing these agendas and stories based around it. It's like, no, people who people who are hardcore country fans don't like our music. So they're not going to they're definitely not going to like our music sometimes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, what I mean? it's just like super hardcore rock fans. Like we just charted at, at an active rock. But I'm sure there's some really hardcore rock fans that don't like what we do. What the hell are these guys doing here? You know, <laughs> you know, and they're wondering what are we doing there. So I mean, you know, it's it's just you know, it's another day. At least it keeps it interesting. <laughs> I mean, that's why know. I've always I, I always wanted to try that out as a, uh, a hybrid country rock format of playing your you know your Leonard Skinnerds and your you know I think there's actually a serious station it's like it's called like Red White and Brew or something like that yeah. and Where they play a little bit of the, yeah the... they play a little country like a Cody Jinx or something or Morgan Wallen yeah. but then also we'll play a little bit of rock too I've always wanted to have that on as, as a terrestrial station I think that would be pretty popular instead our rock formats now are alternative which i don't know what we're alternate alternating from anymore and your classic rock station that plays that doesn't go another half hour without playing van halen so right. yeah well you know do you, you know how classic rock stations came about i, I a buddy of mine is one of the big uh, guys for cumulus told me the rec record companies had basically bought all the, or stole all the publishing from all the artists and one day they're all sitting around going well all these artists are pretty much done and we have all these songs what do we do and the guy goes, I got an idea. So we're going to start classic rock format. 
So they started an entire radio, like like an entire industry of radio, so they could collect the royalties. So they're like, I so they. I had no idea that one. Yeah, no, I didn't. See, I didn't hear that. <laughs> I know. So they programmed all these classic rock stations with all the stuff that they own, and they're just like. Yeah, those are classic rock. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so yeah, that's 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 that. And anyways, and back to radio. The weirdest thing about radio is, is really music is just a, is a, uh, is a safe, is a space holder to get to a commercial. So in all honesty, most radio stations only want songs that motivate you enough to stay listening, not to get overly motivated to go listen to the song somewhere else. They so, actually so you can rate, buy their crap when they get to commercials. Well, they, they rate songs one to five. A, like a one is a shitty song and a five is a great song, like an amazing song or like an over the top song. Like, Honestly, Achy Breaky Heart is a five. It's it motivates people. They wanted to hear it. Um, that it's what's called a it's a gold song. In, yeah, it's in like the old, radio old time road. Don't like the song, but it was one of those that was super active. But if you write a three, a three is exactly what they want because it keeps you engaged enough to get to the Tide commercial. It keeps you engaged enough to get to the Bud commercial or whatever. You know, I mean, it doesn't. You don't get so like, oh, I'm gonna, oh man, I want to hear that song, or I'm gonna go buy that song. So it's a very weird, again, I'm very happy that we're not part of this whole game at this point. We do our own thing. We live in our own little world. We're in the Rick Monroe and the Hitman world where we have Six Gun Soul. <laughs> right. Go buy it. <laughs> you could buy it. You could stream them like you like you have here. Some of your some of the songs here. I, I was just listening to oh, yeah. Gypsy Soul. Uh, uh, that That's on. Usually it comes on and I get some of my friends like, I like this. Who is this? This and then they'll, they'll like guess who it sounds like. And I say, no, it's Rick Monroe. Or, who? What? And I'm like, nah, I go check him out, and then I start playing uh, your catalog. So it's a, it's a, it, it's a, it's great. But yeah, you can stream for whatever, or you could actually buy the album Six Gun Soul, which is available this week, uh, yeah. April twelfth. So that's gonna, and the, and then you guys are going out on tour. You're having your uh, big album reveal in Nashville down uh, over on on April tenth, and then I'm gonna go see you in Columbus uh, about ten days later. Yeah, it's going to be cool because that's also a record store day. And I know that um, we're participating in that. I don't know where, but that's kind of cool. And then um, the other thing, too, is if they actually go to our website, rickmonroe.com, they can get uh, a limited edition autograph version, too, right right now. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah rickmonroe.com. And here's uh, this is the music video. I, I'm also playing a little bit for the audio so because I don't want to get dinged on YouTube again, get dinged again. Uh, but Worth the Hurt, that's your lead single from the new album and it's actually, a, 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 again another great not track on the album. that's actually not on the album we did that one is just a, a like oh that's not on the album oh okay it's, it's a, it's a, that's the one we actually we sent to active rock and we just charted number 25 this week at active rock on that which is wild and um the the focus track is called which way is home off the record and that'll be coming out on the 12th as well and we have a really cool video for that so we're really excited about all that that's great. I and I do I do really like this song, but yeah, like again, that hybrid, that classic country sound, but classic rock sound that yeah. there is an audience for it. It's just again with how radio stations are a lot more what they call modal. For people who don't know, radio stations usually have a playlist of about 250, 300 songs. You would think it's way more and that, oh, you'll never know what you're gonna get next. So it's like yeah, you kind of kind of will. You'll be in the ballpark. You're not going to have a lot of B-sides or a lot of lesser known songs. But uh, that's why with Spotify, yeah, you guys, unfortunately, musicians don't make the kind of money that they did back in the day. But there's also a lot more exposure and you're getting to talk to a different audience that it's part of their algorithm. They're, you're like, oh, hey, I like this song. And then it's like, what's what's recommended for me next? And it really is kind of a game changer in the streaming world. It can be, and they're working on it. They're working on the algorithm a lot more. It's still, but it is weird that it's 0. 0.004 cents. I didn't know you could split split a penny so so <laughs> so. Yeah, much. don't don't spend it all in one place. No, no, we don't. Yeah, that video was cool. I forgot how cool that was. Oh, we just yeah. did that. It's cool because we do all our own production. You know, so it's really neat because all the videos and stuff are we we do in house. So uh, it's always we're we're really proud of that as well. Including the Beyonce song, which was done what right right where you guys are standing and saying. Basically, yeah, without because we, now we have all the gear in here because we were rehearsing in the house. But uh, yeah, that gear wasn't here, and then. Uh, 
So what, uh, like as far as uh, artists and everything, because I've, I've heard you guys play classic rock, current rock, grunge, but then also the you know the typical, like the Hat Act, Alan Jackson, Chattahoochee stuff, and some of the newer, is there, is there was, was there kind of a genre that brought you guys together, not just country, but like a specific uh, part of it where you're like, that's perfect for the band. That's perfect. That's going to fit. That's cohesive and everything. And it just kind of came together. Was there, was there like a religious experience that brought you guys all together too? Gothic death metal. <laughs> death metal. Perfect. I like a little bit of that. No, I mean, a, little, you know, a little speed metal. I think, I think we all bring our own individual influences and it just kind of works. It just melts together. Perfect. And like that perfect harmonious type thing. Yeah, because I mean, like, what's like your main influences? Because you're from Seattle. Here's the thing: we have New York, Seattle, Kentucky, and Florida. I was just going to ask that because, you, yeah, you guys aren't all just typical Nashville guys living right down the street from Broadway, and you're like, well, we were raised on this. So you really came from different backgrounds. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's like your what? What are your main? It's all about like '90s grunge, Allison Chain, Soundgarden, all that stuff. You know, Pearl yeah. Jam, and Bobby. Yeah. I, I'm a metalhead with a little bit of a moderate soul in here and there with like certain i don't know lighter rock and you know, guitar hero type stuff as well <laughs> of course you know yeah, but, and Alan, Alan. but definitely a, definitely a metal head yeah, yeah. I, mostly classic rock i freaking love skinner and like molly hatchet eagles and, uh, yeah eagles, eagles eagle big eagles fan uh but also tool yeah <laughs> <laughs> from eagles I, to I, I was at a bar last <laughs> week and i was in florida and I, i'm sitting at the bar and the bartender was telling me it's like you just missed Artemis Pyle was here. And I'm like, what? Really? The drummer from Le Leonard Skinner? He he was just at the bar. He was going to a place over in uh, Boca to to play the Funky Biscuit. And it would have been cool to hang out with the, I mean, the guy was in a plane crash. He survived yeah, he, the plane crash. Guy. You know, it's funny because our, our publicist um, works with him. And she was just like, hey, if you guys ever want Artemis to do a track for you guys, we could probably do that. So, yeah, I, I, I might I might take her up on that because that'd be pretty cool. I think that's outstanding. And yeah, with, with some of those influences, and it's always funny to see, like you said, where you guys are from all across the country. And I, I it was a couple of years ago, I went to see Wheeler Walker Jr. And he's Ooh. introducing the band. And it's so weird because it's a guy who sings songs about eating pussy. And yet he's got a great band, but the band, again, not necessarily Southern rock people. It's the guitarist is from Cleveland. The drummer's from Detroit. The bassist is from uh, Indianapolis. It's amazing how people just kind of flock to that area and how Nashville has really taken off from where, when I was going there back in the early nineties, Nashville was kind of a, I don't want to say it was a dead town, but it wasn't what it is now. The, the really the East well, coast of Vegas last five years, it's even blown up even more. So yeah. no, it's, it's, it is the, destination for everybody it is music city i mean we have it's funny man because we have so many different types of music and musicians that are here yeah, that's why it's not country music city it's music city. it's music city like you're doing something called rare hair which is yeah. something they do all the time which they'll do like different they'll do like different metal acts or they'll do like rocket acts and all yeah that. Uh, we're and actually we're getting together to do one song that's what this event is it's at the uh, basement east and what they do is uh the you know through emails and whatnot you'll get on a little uh a little list or you know you'll, you'll figure out what song you want to play you know you send a uh, well you send in five songs off of a list that they're going to play that night that you probably want to be on and they'll stick you on one of them you'll get this email because the guy that runs the whole thing usually trusts you you know uh, and they'll stick in one of the songs and then you get the one song you're on with people that you've heard of that you might play with before or somebody you've never played with before maybe you get together to rehearse once and then you play that one song uh together at the uh at the concert you know and I, I think yeah this what, two Tuesdays from now, I'm playing uh, Perfect Strangers, Deep Purple. Yeah, they'll do like like this one. Is it is it an all Deep Purple night or is it? Just... No, it's just gonna be like an era and it's maybe a, a theme. Yeah, it's theme good. based. So they'll do that like know? they did a Van Halen theme based, and they brought in his like Alex uh, Van Halen's drum set. You know, and again, and it's all these oh, country guys. One, that, that... one theme, one theme that I did was uh, was the coolest. Uh, was they were doing '80s metal bands, but covers that they did. Um, so uh, the one I did, for example, was uh, Mr. Big when they covered Humble Pie's 30 Days in the Hole. But the guest bass player was Billy Sheen. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so I got to play with Billy Sheen. Yeah. Did you guys actually play together? Yeah, was, this is not where you wasn't a rare hair. No, it was, it was a, a tribute to Neil Peart. Uh, it was a rush tribute. Yeah. Yeah. When Neil Peart, I mean, said, I mean, Peart died. <laughs> uh, they, they had a rush tribute. And uh, I met him actually at a rehearsal because they were having a rehearsal because, you know, rush songs. 
most, if not everybody, has to at least run through it at a rehearsal with their people, not just get up there and yeah. do throw yeah. and go. Unless it's like, uh, uh, what was the first one there? Working Man. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so what it was, I guess a lot of people just couldn't make it, especially the guitar player for his song to practice, but everybody else made it. So I just hopped up there with him and practiced it with him to get the band you know, uh, polished up on the song. But then actually at the show, I played something different with different people. <laughs> so that's kind of how I knew him. And then I walked in the studio and Malcolm's got it going. And I'm like, oh, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna ask because uh when you when you go to Nashville and you have these random guys that are playing in uh, a couple couple of those bars and honky tonks and every everything that uh, they've played with some of the greats and yet here you are at some on a an off night on a Wednesday and you're like wait a second this guy played on the tracks with Conway Twitty he played with Merle Haggard and everything oh, where's some other random guys that... oh yeah one Monday night um the my front guy he's a drummer uh couldn't have a drummer and he brought in tom hearst tom hearst has been well was tracy lawrence's drummer for years maybe even two decades almost so he played drums plus he runs a thing kind of like rare hair uh loud jams runs one of those as well um you know yeah so you'll never know who you get stuck with uh tom yankton you know he's yeah. the one that did van halen the hagar thing on rare hair when i played the van halen song and absolutely crushed it um so yeah you had that a lot and actually it'll be downtown and artists come walking through i've had Gretchen Wilson jump up on stage while we're playing to uh, 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 what the hell's his name? It just got in the for the assault. Oh, Chris Young, actually, yeah, oh, he was yes. on stage a couple times. <laughs> yeah, I just got an assault charge. Oh yeah, Chris <laughs> Young. <laughs> no, he didn't get assaulted. He was uh, he had to press. Yeah, assault. no, he got he got he assault. Had to press the assault charge, right? So like yeah, I mean, so yeah, I mean, Nashville I, is Nashville is um, definitely um, it is music city, but uh, yeah, but anyways. You'll never know who you run into. It's it's so great when you're like, wait a second, I like, do you, like do 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 you fanboy sometimes when you see some of these people? You're well, like, wow, I'm actually well, getting up on one stage. Time, one time I was playing on Miranda Lambert's grand opening with a friend of ours. You know, she she came in of course with all our people. It wasn't even them. Uh, you know, yeah, all the stars came in. Hardy who wasn't quite big at the time, he even came through. That was pretty cool. But I wouldn't say I fanboyed off of any of them. But the one time I would say I almost fanboyed, or rather than say that I got like weirded out because like I'm playing guitar and he's probably one of the best like session guitars. Or uh, he's playing with um, uh, uh, Garfunkel now, I think. Uh, his name's Guthrie Tratt amazing guitar player. I remember he walked through and I almost got nervous. And I was like, the party's upstairs. Please go upstairs and stop listening to me play. <laughs> <laughs> be a part and whatnot. Yeah, you wouldn't, but it's like, yeah, you, you see, you got nervous. That, that's, that most people would not have, probably have no idea who he is unless you're a musician's musicians or a guitar player. Yeah, that's yeah. how it is in the studio too. Like yeah. working in the session world here, Vince Gill, Garth Brooks, all these guys just come to the studio and hang out. They're not you know, doing something, <laughs> working next door to the other room. Oh, yeah. What's her name? Uh, Nita Strauss. I just saw yeah. her at a show. And, yeah. yeah, she was like in the building one time when we were cutting our album. She, she was cutting her album right next to ours. Yeah. What's up yeah. when Junior was in the other studio? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. That's right. <laughs> what the hell's that band? Right, right. Yeah, we were playing, and Greta Van Fleet was next door, and I kept going, oh, Zeppelin Jr.'s over there. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't like that. I Honestly, I don't really fanboy over musicians, because that's what we do. I'm actually, I fanboy more over, like, athletes and stuff, because I'll never throw a touchdown pass. I'll never, God, you know, I, it's so mean. It's Tom, Tom Brady was around the corner. We have to get a restraining order. Yeah. On, right? <laughs> Tom Brady's dreamy. <laughs> or Tim Tebow yep. or something. No, because, I mean, actually, I just... I mean, musicians, I mean, I I think when I met Bonnie Raitt, that was probably really, actually, when I met Robert Plant, that was the one time I was like, I, I actually, I would probably never do this, but I finally, I was standing in a bar and I walked up and I'm just like, hey, I'd hate myself if I didn't at least say hi to you. You know, you're standing here, you're Robert Plant, it's been really nice to meet you. And I go, hey, is there any chance that I could take a picture? And he's like, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm kind of like, um, and then I started like, I started kind of like backpedaling a little bit. I'm like, hey, wait a second. I said, you know, one of my friends that I work with, his dad used to manage you guys. And, you know, and he's like, oh, yeah, Jackie boy bought me a drink. He's like, have a drink with me. I'm like, picture with Robert Plant or sit here and drink with him. I'll drink with him. So by the time I drank with him, it, it, I never got the picture, but we spent a long time and we told some great stories. He told me a, a Lukather story that was pretty outrageous. And um, so, so that was cool. I've heard a lot of Luke stories. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this one was about stirring a drink with his um male part. And I was like, that must have been a Jägermeister. And he's like, it was. 
<laughs> that's, that so, sounds like something in hot water would have. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah and, that, and, and, Gina and, would love that one. Talking about small world. Uh, so Lucas, their uh, his old band, well, two total back in the day, they had their original bass player, uh, um, David Hungate, I think is his name. He has a son, Noah Hungate, who's a drummer, and he plays downtown, and I frequently play with his son on drums. There you go. Yeah, and, small uh, world. And, and they do like total tributes as well and whatnot. So of course, we play the total song. He, nails all Carlos parts. Oh yeah. Uh, Should yeah. play Thriller, some Michael Jackson since he played basically all their guitar parts except the solo and beat it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually uh Luke uh, I accidentally ran his son uh Trevor in uh, LA when he was supporting this girl uh vocalist. Uh, we were out in LA doing a thing and this girl came in vocals with her, her guitar player and it was Trevor Lukather at the time and look at his face like oh yeah he's definitely his dad's kid. Then he started playing as like, he's good, you know, the, the Steve's a an animal best thing about steve was he used to play the baked potato and in between his sets like or between songs he would read penthouse forum <laughs> oddest thing i've ever seen it'd be done be like and then i noticed the nice supple you know <laughs> you're like wow that's weird so, i never would have thought it happened on a old dirt road but here i am <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh we've covered quite a bit here <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's it's amazing who you'll run into, and uh, oh, well, my here's here's my stupid claim to fame, which is not a claim to fame. It's just dumb stories that I can I can manipulate this story any way I want. I went to see Everclear one time, and at the end of the show during Santa Monica, the bassist held his bass out, and I plucked like two strings, so I can say that I played Santa Monica with Everclear and Art <laughs> Right on. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't I, even plugged I in. Right? Didn't care. I'll get your autograph next time I see you when we see you in Columbus. Yes, absolutely. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, it'll say Aaron Berg on it. <laughs> Just in, in inside references for everybody. But uh, yeah, no, uh, but I want everybody to go actually buy the album and yes. uh, go check that out. That is uh, that album. I'm trying to share it. I was trying to stall time, but I couldn't multitask there. Uh, but yes, that album, Six Guns Soul, go buy it on Amazon. Go to rickmonroe.com. Go check them out on tour. There's also a place on the website you can request a show. So if you know a venue that is big enough for them, because trust me, uh, the venue when I saw you guys there is just, it's a great venue for a local singer songwriter, but you guys are, should be playing on big stages. I know you guys did uh, play, you played a tour with Ted Nugent a couple of years ago, which I, I mean, that's, that's, I, I asked you about that, Rick, how was that playing with Ted Nugent? I, I thought it was awesome. I mean, it was, it was funny. Like um, the first, first thing we show up, Ted walks in the room and I guess he comes up to what, like one of you guys. He goes, like, are you both these two? And he's like, um, are, are you guys a singer? And they're like, no. He's like, good. I don't like singers. And then he walks <laughs> and takes him, shows him like his guitars and stuff. And then we get done with our first night. And Ted's like, man, I don't know, man. You guys aren't really a country band. You know what? Because you guys have balls. And he goes, you know why? <laughs> and I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah. He goes, I, you know, you know, Toby Keith, rest his soul. He was like, man, I used to tell Toby Keith and Blake Shelton. I'm like, you know, man, you guys just don't have balls. He goes, you know why I don't play country? I'm like, well, Ted, because you have balls. Damn right. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit. Holy <laughs> right. shit. Yeah, I'd be like, and that was my first experience. I'm just hanging out backstage with them. I'm like, all right, cool, man. Have a great show. And I walked away. And I was just like, all right, well, that's Ted. <laughs> my first experience so to me was the quintessential Ted, you know, kind of come walking by. He glanced at our room. So we had a small little room there. Um, and uh, Burke Brock. Did yeah. It? <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, it was funny. Actually, we were sitting in the room and we heard like kind of a, a commotion, if you will, or conversation of a couple people, but the one voice towering over all of it. We didn't even see him. We knew right away. I was like, oh, Ted's here. We just knew it. We had it. We yeah. just knew. And um, you know, he goes in the room there. They can show him around. He's situated. And, and him and I are still sitting in this little dressing room. And he comes walking by and he peeks while he's walking and can, continues for a couple steps, then turns around. And we can't even see him. We hear, Are you guys the band? And he comes walking in. I'm like, oh, shit, he's going to come talk to us. That's pretty damn cool. But yeah, and he has that exchange. Are we the singer? Or what do we do with the singer? Has that little small thing. And then he goes, All right. So who's the guitar player? I mean, he looks at him. He goes, it's my kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm going to go out and check my guitars. I'm going to come check out the Birdlands. And it wasn't even waiting for an answer. You just walk kind of like, either you're going to make it there or you're not. You know? <laughs> well, the, the craziest thing was the very first show we played was his wife's birthday. So I think we ingratiated ourselves because I, I wish her a happy birthday on stage. When we get done, I walk by her. I'm like, hey, we played for your birthday. You're welcome. Happy birthday. <laughs> she like, she loved us ever since but after that. So, uh, 
Yeah. That's outstanding. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, to seeing you guys again and looking forward to hearing the new album comes out again April 12th. Go buy it. Uh again, if you want to go on Amazon, you want to do that and but uh, go see them in person, go to rickmanroad.com, go see them live, go buy some merchandise for God's sake and yeah. uh and go go support a band that uh it is really just it has balls as ted nugent told them yeah. they have balls and uh go 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 Good buy balls. it but, I like uh, balls. <laughs> <laughs> but rick, rick guys gentlemen the hitmen it's uh good to talk to you. I'm looking forward to putting this out and and uh, and again getting a chance to see you guys. And honestly, good luck with the good luck with the album. Good luck with the follow up album that you guys are already getting ready for. And good luck with the tour and everything else going on forward. I mean, you guys, you guys have a great sound. You have a sound that fits people that are kind of like, oh, okay, I want a little bit more rock. I want more more balls in my music than this Beyonce and Taylor Swift stuff. And uh, so you guys have a really good market for it. And Again, uh, I dig it, um, and I hope others do too. Cool. Well, thank you very much, brother. We appreciate it. And thank you, folks, for listening to the Check Your Brain podcast and even watching it, too, on YouTube and Rumble. And again, every Wednesday, this podcast goes out for free. So go check that out on your major podcast platforms, YouTube, Rumble, and go to Patreon at patreon.com slash Tony Mazer. My name is Tony Mazer, and I'll be back with you next week with another episode on this fine, non-award-winning podcast. Thanks, everybody. Bye.